Hey there, folks. Welcome to the lecture for week three of Human Nature, Democracy, Sustainability, and the Fate of Civilizations. I'm the professor for this course, Kevin McKay. Uh, this is a lecture that I'm doing after the fact because for some reason the one uh, that we did on uh, week three did not record. Um, so anyway, uh, let's dive in. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the first of the five horsemen of the modern day apocalypse, which I talk about in my book, Radical Transformation. So these are five um, areas of systemic dysfunction that are threatening our current industrial capitalist global civilization that are threatening us with collapse. So what we're going to be looking at today is, sorry, the first two, uh, which are dissociation and scale and complexity. And in many ways, these, these things that we're going to be looking at, these are problems of information. Uh, they uh, deal with the fact that living in uh, massive, complex, interconnected, global societies make it really hard for us to understand, first of all, how those complex systems work. Um, and also, it makes it hard for us to understand if we make changes, what will the ultimate effects of those changes be? So let's dive in. The first thing I want to talk about is dissociation. And so um, dissociation, again, like I said, it's a problem of information. And the, the, the way to conceptualize this is that if we go back in time and we look at the earliest human civilizations, you know, we all evolved as human beings, as hunter gatherers, like small bands living directly off the land. You know, I have a picture of the Kung San Bushmen from the Kalahari here. Uh, they live in a way that is close. It's obviously not identical. I mean, they have, you know, their, their cultures have, have evolved over thousands of years, um, but they are similar uh, to the way that we all used to live as, as human beings. We used to live directly off the land in these very small sort of equal uh, politically equal bands. And the incredible thing about this way of living is that these groups were able to survive for thousands of years within the same ecological niche, right? So that's quite impressive. Um, and one of the ways in which they were able to do this to be so sustainable was because they received accurate and timely feedback concerning the effects of their actions on their surroundings. You can imagine this, right? So for instance, if you're a hunter-gatherer group and you go out and you gather all the food and you hunt and kill all the animals in your area, well then what are you gonna do uh, two weeks from then, right? You're gonna have no food. So there was immediate feedback in the sense of how you interact with the environment. You had to be aware of the ecosystem you existed within. You had to be aware of not exceeding its limits because if you did, the feedback was immediate. All of a sudden, there's no food, right? You're going to start or you've got to move somewhere else, right? You've got to constantly keep moving. So um, small scale groups didn't have to do that because they, they took the feedback and they adjusted their way of life. And this incredible feedback loop, we're going to talk about feedback loops in a, in a few lectures, um, or sorry, not in a few lectures, in a few slides. But this, this incredible um, process enabled them to be sustainable for thousands of years. Our current society um, is not sustainable for thousands of years, right? So clearly there's been a disconnect between the information that we're getting. And it is the size and the complexity of industrial civilization that really makes this challenging, that cuts off the feedback. And without this feedback, you know, in terms of our impact, the impact of our actions on other people living in other parts of the world, the impact of our actions on the biosphere that sustains life, without this feedback, it makes it impossible to know how to act both ethically and sustainably. So that's what dissociation is about. It's about being dissociation, dissociated from a feedback right, from information, okay? Um, so there's three kinds of dissociation that I wanna talk about now. The first one is based on things happening far away from us, right? And so one of the hallmarks of our current civilization, industrial capital civilization, is first of all, it is a global civilization. It links all of the countries in the globe in an economic, political, and cultural framework, okay? And because all of the supply chains and all the economic um, activity is globalized, we are cut off. Any one individual in any one country 
doesn't have a sense of the whole, doesn't have a sense of where most of our products come from, because we simply can't see it, right? So it cuts us off from this critical information. We see this, for instance, you know, in terms of the food we buy, the clothes we buy, uh, where our energy comes from, right? Do most people really know where the power comes from when they're plugging in appliances, you know, and the electricity is just there? Do you know if it's coming from a nuclear power plant or from a coal-fired power plant or from a hydroelectric dam, um, you know, from, from maybe solar panels or wind turbines? Like most Canadians, anyway, have zero idea about any of that. Um, same thing with our waste too, right? Like we are in, in, a, in, in a country like Canada, we um, throw out a ton of stuff. We create tons of garbage, almost more than any other country in the world. Do people really know where that garbage goes? Do they know if it's going to a landfill? Is it going to an incinerator to be burned? Is it being piled on barges and shipped to third world countries, right? All of these things happen, but we don't really know exactly what's going on. We just throw stuff out. We throw it in the garbage, garbage bag goes to the curb, out of sight, out of mind, right? So we're not getting this feedback about what's actually, what's the impact of these actions, right? You know, finally, we can look at our consumer goods. So all of the things we buy, whether it's tech, technology, um, again, you know, clothing, um, you know, cars, it, it doesn't matter what it is. Again, do we have a sense of how it was made, where it was made? Were the workers treated well, right? Um, is that business environmentally sustainable, right, or not? You know, we don't know these things. And an example of this is the whole sweatshop phenomenon, right? And that's what this, um, this picture here is from. You know, this idea that you can have um, a young woman here, and so maybe she's in Canada, let's say, and she's like, oh, well, I bought this, this uh, dress for $50. You know, maybe it's, it, it looks like fast fashion. Maybe she bought it at H&M, right, in Lime Ridge Mall in Hamilton, buys it for $50, and then there is uh, a young woman, same age, and maybe she's living in, you know, uh, Pakistan or Indonesia or, you know, uh, Thailand or one of these countries where there's these huge um, textile factories. And she's like, yeah, well, I got paid 60 cents to make that dress, right? And so again, you know, does the young woman in North America know that there are women of her age or yet really young girls, let's be honest here, that are being exploited in order to make these products, in order to make these garments. Again, most of us just don't know, right? So that's what spatial dissociation is all about. The problem is things happen far away from us, so we can't see them. Another form of dissociation is temporal dissociation, or temporal dissociation. And temporal refers to time, okay? And the problem here is that we're cut off from feedback concerning our actions because the consequences of our actions take place at longer time scales than we are used to thinking about, right? So two examples here are, for instance, political and economic collapses. So a society doesn't just kind of fall apart overnight, right? Um, and of course, in the first few lectures, we've, we've covered the fact that a heck of a lot of societies have fallen apart. Massive empires, huge civilizations have collapsed. It happens all the time. However, it doesn't happen like that, right? It takes years and years, sometimes decades, you know, for a collapse to occur. And so really, the problem here is that, you know, individual human beings living in these civilizations and societies, we don't think in terms of that long term, we're so wrapped up in our daily lives, right, that we're, we don't realize that certain processes that are unfolding in the present, and in the short term, that those processes are ultimately catastrophic. It's hard for us to see that because we're not good at looking down the road and predicting what's going to happen. Same thing with ecological collapses. Again, an ecosystem does not just collapse overnight. It takes years of degradation of ecological overshoot, which we're going to talk about in lecture uh, number five. Um, it takes years and years of basically um, negative impacts on an ecosystem before it finally collapses. So again, you could be engaged real time in those actions that are going to destroy that ecosystem. But because the collapse isn't going to happen for 20 or 30 years, it's like out of sight, out of mind. We don't think about it. 
And um, sometimes it can even take centuries, right, for an ecosystem to collapse. Um, you know, and, and we, we're seeing this all around us. And, and we're really going to talk about this, like I said, when uh, we get into lecture five and we talk about ecological overshoot. Um, but to sort of prefigure that conversation, um, I am going to give one example from ecology that, I, that hopefully will help us think about this idea of things can take a lot of time, catastrophic things. But then all of a sudden, when a certain threshold is reached, they get really bad really quick. An example of this is a process known as eutrophication. And this is basically uh, when lakes and rivers get polluted over time. So freshwater ecosystems um, are polluted and usually it's um, runoff from agricultural practices. And what I mean by runoff is that, you know, you can have, you know, farms and, and in, in North America, you know, 95% of the farms are industrial agriculture, which means they use tons of fertilizer and tons of pesticides. So all these chemicals are getting soaked into the crops all the time, right, to keep them viable and to produce large amounts of corn or soybeans or wheat or whatever it is right and so what happens is when it rains all of that stuff washes into the watersheds watersheds are your lakes and rivers right and what happens then is all of those nutrients that fertilizer um, but also you know pesticides and whatnot they flow into these um, bodies of water and they start causing uh, basically an overgrowth of algae. Um, and then the algae starts choking out the oxygen in these uh, rivers and lakes. And over time, it takes a while for this to happen. But over time, those bodies of water start to die, right? Another big source of um, pollution is sewage too, obviously from, uh, from municipalities, right? Um, also from, you know, uh, from pig farms. Uh, from chicken farms, right? You know, uh, all of this stuff just gets flushed into lakes and streams and rivers, and it slowly pollutes them over time until the point where all of a sudden it's dead, right? But we can't see that, you know? You'll just keep pumping the sewage for 10, 30, 50, even 100 years and be like, oh, everything's fine. Oh, there's still fish in that. Oh, there's no more fish, right? That's kind of how it happens. But we're cut off from that because maybe that's going to happen 20 or 30 years down the road. Uh, there was a really interesting book written um, by a geographer known as David Harvey. Um, this was back in the 1990s. He wrote a book called The Condition of Postmodernity. And he was talking about this whole idea of temporal dissociation. And what he sort of said is that it's built right into uh, capitalist industrial economies that how you make money in industrial capitalist societies is you need to constantly speed up the rate of production, consumption, and profit making. You know, that's how you make more money. You need to turn things over more and more quickly. And he said this leads to a type of temporal hyper compression. So compression is things getting smaller, temporal is time, and hyper compression means things getting really small. So what does this mean? He's saying our sense of time in industrial capital societies gets very, very condensed, very, very tight. And this leads to, you know, there needs to be constant upgrades to travel infrastructure, to communications infrastructure, to business infrastructure. You need to be able to do transactions faster and faster, right? And we've seen this. You can zip money back and forth uh, on the internet, you know, you can trade stocks in a second using your, your uh, home trading software. We're seeing this in, uh, especially, you know, today in, in uh, cryptocurrency markets, which are just like rapidly rising and falling and fortunes being won and lost in a fraction of a second, right? And so what this tends to do is it means that our society is super focused on a very short time frame. So this, this really hurts us. We need to be looking long-term to be aware of some of these looming crises, whether it's political collapses or ecological collapses. And yet the mechanism of our economy encourages the exact opposite. It encourages more and more hyper-compressed sense of time. And this is what in my book I call corporate time, right? And so, you know, Corporate time is because that's how our economy is set up, right? It's dominated by large corporations, by, by business in general. 
And uh, you know, on the stock market, now it's literally fractions of a second. A lot of trading by the big banks, the big investment banks, it just happens, it's all computers, just shifting currencies back and forth and making money off slight fluctuations in currency markets. Um, oops, sorry, let me just go back there. Um, I'll just give a few other examples here. I mean, the other thing too, is that you know, um, the business cycle is part of what structures our consciousness in our uh, um, economies, right? And the business cycle is, you got quarterly reports, quarterly financial reports, you've got year ends. So every year you look at how you did, you do your yearly projections, you know, and in our society, long-term planning for businesses is like three to five years, right? And um, that's not that long, right? In other societies, they look at that and be like, what the heck, like that's, that's almost no time at all. So let's contrast this with other ways of looking at time, the way that other civilizations look at it. And I think this will help us understand how, how really uh, different industrial capitalist society is. So if we look at another way of um, understanding time, we can contrast it with um, the worldview of traditional societies. So these are societies that live much more closely with the land. They live much more closely to the way that we all used to live as human beings, you know, a couple thousand years ago. And so an example close to home is the Haudenosaunee or Six Nations Confederacy. And uh, these are, you know, six different um, indigenous nations that have formed a confederacy. Uh, they live um, in, you know, where we're, where we're in in present day Hamilton. This is traditional Haudenosaunee uh, land. There's a big uh, reservation just uh, north of Hamilton, or sorry, just south of Hamilton, um, which is uh, known as Six Nations. So uh, the, this is a local First Nations community. And how do they look at time? Well, they have what, it's what, what they call the law of seven generations, right? And the law of seven generations basically means that for the leaders in Haudenosaunee society, if they're going to make decisions, important decisions, not like decisions of like, hey, where we're going to have lunch today, right? Um, but important decisions about, you know, their community, their economy, um, you know, building new infrastructure, forming alliances, whatever it is, right? Anything big, they say you need to think about the impact of that decision seven generations down the road, right? And if you think about on an average of most, most uh, demographers, most people that study populations, a generation is on average like, you know, 25 years. So that means that the Haudenosaunee are saying that if you're going to make a big decision, you need to think about the impact 175 years in the future. Now, to most kind of North Americans, most people who've grown up in Ocapolis, and growing up in a capitalist society, that seems insane. It's like, are you kidding me? No, like if, if we're thinking three years ahead, we're like, whoa, pat on the back, good long-term planning guy, right on, right? Crazy, 175 years in the future. And yet there's a lot of wisdom to this because what they're saying is you better understand how what you're doing today impacts future generations. Again, we can barely plan five years in advance if we're lucky, right? You gotta even think about it in terms of our political systems. Political systems are based on the electoral cycle. The electoral cycle is how many, how much time is there between elections? And we know that's what politicians focus on. Their biggest thing is getting elected again in three years, four years, five years, depending on the country you're in, right? Uh, they have different um, spans of time between elections. So, you know, even your, your main decision makers are locked into this like four year uh, cycle in Canada anyway. So, you know, we can't even plan beyond that really. Um, and you've got to ask yourself, which view of time is more wise, which is more prudent, which is better for the long-term sustainability of your civilization? And folks, I think it's, it's a rhetorical question. It's kind of a no brainer. I mean, obviously, the Haudenosaunee have us dead to rights here. I mean, it's clearly a much more uh, wise, considered, um, evolved way of looking at the impacts of your actions down the road. And this is why throughout this course, folks, like, you know, I've already mentioned this, but I'm going to mention this every time I talk about a quote unquote traditional society. Um, you know, back 40, 50 years ago, anthropologists would have called this a primitive society, right? But 
there's a big problem with that language and it's because primitive tends to mean less evolved or more sort of like naive or simplistic but there's a big problem with that because let's think about this this is a, a society when i call it a traditional society right um, or sometimes we call them small scale societies they live more closely with the natural world with natural cycles right when you think of the Haudenosaunee they still have that in their culture in their spirituality in their sense of uh, social organization and politics and what I'm arguing here is that is actually a more sophisticated way of viewing time it's actually a more intelligent more scientifically valid way of looking at time than our super high-tech ultra modern, uh, super capitalist North American society, right? Um, we're the ones that are primitive in the way that we view time, because it's, it's, it's literally to a certain extent insane how we're not planning ahead for things. There's a way this really plays out. Hopefully this will, this will kind of um, bring it home a little bit um, because we're gonna talk about the last form of dissociation, but then I, I wanna link it back to temporal dissociation a little bit. Empathic dissociation is the fact that we are cut off from the impacts of our actions on other human beings. And this is due to a few different reasons, partly spatial dissociation, because we don't see the effects on other people. So we don't know, like maybe that we're hurting people by our actions. But there's also this idea of um, how temporal dissociation can empathically separate us from people too. And the idea here is intergenerational tyranny. This is a really important concept, and especially for you know folks taking this course who are who are younger, who are you know in their late teens, um, uh, early twenties. Uh, you know your generation. You've obviously already heard in this course that uh, there's a lot of problems that your generation is being saddled with, whether it is economic problems, political problems, serious ecological problems, climate change, ecosystem collapse, and the whole thing is, folks you had nothing to do with those. You didn't create them. You didn't ask for those problems to be given to you, right? And this is something that we sometimes forget about when we think about how our society functions. Um, our generation right now, young folks in their early 20s, are being piled on all of these serious, serious issues to solve. Think about the generation to come after, even more intense right? Oh, there's no more fish. Oh, sorry, there's runaway climate change. Oh, oopsie, there was World War III. Like, anyway, I hope none of those things happen. But all of these things are possibilities. That other generation, what say did they have in that? They had no say in that. That is intergenerational tyranny. It's when the present generation just doesn't give a damn about what their actions are going to do for the generations that come after. And this is going to sound pretty harsh, folks, but I defy anyone to argue against me when I say that is exactly how industrial capitalist civilization functions. It is a whole bunch of people that really, if you think about how they're acting, don't give a damn about the generations that come after. They're quite happy to spend all the money, pump all the oil, and cut down all the forests and, and kill all the fish and kill all the other animals. Like they're, they seem quite willing to do that, right? It's a big problem. And it's, it's, it's interesting too, folks, because if you asked an individual Canadian, let's say, and said, do you, do you care if your kids have the ability to buy a house? Do you care if your kids have like good paying jobs with job security and like healthcare? Do you care if your kids have a livable climate? What parent would be like, no, nah, I don't care, screw them. Every parent would say, of course I do. And yet here's the crazy thing. Then you look at how they behave. You look at the politics they support. You look at the policies they support. And they are doing the exact opposite. So this is why dissociation is such a big thing for us to look at, right? How does this happen? Hopefully, how do we change it? There's another important thing about empathic dissociation as well, too, is that we also tend to be less connected to other human beings based on what I call empathic boundary markers. So these are characteristics or qualities of different human groups that make us go, oh, they're different from me, 
right? So these can be things like quote unquote race, which anthropologists will tell you that's not a biological term. It's actually biologically meaningless. What it simply means is different groups of people look differently. They got slightly different skin colors, slightly different hair colors and uh, different eye colors and stuff like that, right? And you know we have called these races in a very um, simplistic and scientifically incorrect way. And yet races have real effects socially and politically. That's, that's the, the sense in which I'm talking about it. Ethnicity, the same way. Uh, religion, right? We feel separated from different people if we're different religions, from different nationalities, different countries. And also we feel separated from people if we're of a different social class, right? So, you know, a lot of people, if they're just driving down the street, you know, and there's a homeless person walking down the street or they're, you know, panhandling for change or whatnot, we feel cut off from them. Like, like uh, in, a, in a society like ours, we just, we walk past them, we drive past them, right? Uh, we see their tents set up. Do we really think like, oh my God, that's a human being in crisis. That's someone who needs help. A lot of times we don't, you know, and so again, there's all these ways in which we are cut off from that kind of information. Um, and that's, um, that's challenging, because then are we acting ethically and honorably and humanely to those other human beings? In a lot of cases, we're not. So one of the things about dissociation is that, you know, our economic system, I sort of said this before about corporate time, but our economic system is built on dissociation. So consumer capitalism is a, is a dissociation engine, right? And this happens in a number of different ways. Uh, there's a great short video called The Story of Stuff. And it's, it's, it's old now. It's got it. I think it's like 2010, 2011 that it came out, but it is still so on point in terms of explaining how this dissociation is created in industrial capitalist societies. So it's on the course canvas page. I would encourage you to give it a watch. A watch. And so in the story of stuff, it says that, you know, our industrial economy deliberately creates dissociation. And that is 100% true. First of all, most of the raw materials that we need to power industrial economies are taken from poor regions of our own countries or poor countries in other parts of the world, right? So for instance, Canadian mining corporations are all over the world mining all of these raw materials, you know, these minerals that we need to power our industrial economy. Um, but they're not doing it in Canada in most cases uh, because we have laws about, you know, you can't just destroy the environment. You can't exploit your workforce. If someone's on the land you want, you can't just throw them off, right? So that's inconvenient for our mining companies. It's expensive. So instead, they want to go to poor countries where they can just be like, yeah, we're going to give a bit of money to the government. So they turn their, their attention the other way. and We're going to do whatever the hell we want, you know? Oh, hey, there's some uh, a lithium deposit right where this native group happens to live. Well, we're just going to throw them off the land. We're going to get in there. We're going to dig that stuff up. And we're going to get the heck out. We're not going to worry about toxic chemicals left after the mining process. We're not going to worry about the long-term health of that community. That's how our economy is powered, a large part of it. A same thing with pollution and garbage. Um, like I said, a lot of it is piled on barges and it is literally shipped to other countries from rich countries. You know, we export garbage to poor countries, right? Because again, we don't want to deal with it. It's not our problem, right? Um, producers also make it really hard to find out about their production processes. So again, most companies in North America, if you're buying clothing or manufactured goods, they don't want you to know what the factory looks like. You know, can you imagine if like, you know, Adidas and Nike and, you know, all these other uh, companies actually on their labels had pictures of these massive sweatshops where their garments are made? Like, of course, they're not going to do that. They don't want you to know. So again, the issue here is that it's not just that, oh, dissociation tends to happen. Whoopsie. It's deliberately created, right? Corporations know that to a large extent, their business practices are environmentally destructive and exploitative of human beings in poor countries. They know this. They don't want us to know it. So they make it really hard for us to find out. Two other really important concepts that the story of stuff talks about that we should all think about are 
perceived obsolescence and planned obsolescence. These are two strategies that the producers of consumer goods use to get us to buy, 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 buy constantly. Planned obsolescence is probably the most sinister um, uh, of, of the two. And this is the fact that consumer goods are designed to break. That may sound like a, it may sound like I'm talking crazy right now, but this is a fact and it's well known in industrial design that you do not try and build the most durable product that's going to last forever right. Um, in in 95% of industries, you just don't do that right, there is a small subset of industries where this is a good thing, you know, so for instance, certain car manufacturers right have more of a an investment in making long term durable vehicles right. Um, you know, certain tool manufacturers, but they tend to be more sort of boutique uh, producers. The vast majority of industrial design uh, products, all your technology, all your phones, your computers, they're designed to either break in about four or five years or else to be obsolete because basically you switch the part such that, oh, it just doesn't work anymore. Or in terms of computer software, computers, it's so easy. You're just like, oh, well, we're just gonna keep upgrading our operating system twice a year until whoopsie, four or five years, it doesn't even work on your computer anymore. And then you're frozen, right? Uh-oh, you can't do the things you wanna do, time to buy a new computer. As someone who I hold on to computers right until they become <laughs> like literally unusable, that time frame has gotten shorter and shorter. Now for me, the longest I can push um, buying a brand new computer before I need to buy another one is about six years, maybe seven years. And again, like I said, I'm someone who holds on to the bitter end, but they literally start to become unusable after a certain period of time. That's planned obsolescence. They're designing things to break so that you buy more things. Kind of, kind of a crappy thing to think about, right? Perceived obsolescence is the counterpart to this, where it's just that through advertising, they try to convince you that the stuff you have that's perfectly good is no longer good, right? And so this is the idea that, you know, fashion does this all the time, right? Like, oh, what's in this year? Oh, these boots are in. Yay, everyone's got to get these boots, right? And the next year, all the ads are like, oh, those boots are so out of fashion. These are the new boots you need. Oh, everyone got to buy the new boots, right? Even though the old ones are perfectly good. Maybe you can get another two, three years out of them, four years out of them even, right? Hard to say, because a lot of fashion today is garbage and it falls apart. But anyway, uh, perceived obsolescence is just trying to convince you that what you've got eh, may work, but it's not cool anymore. And you want to be cool, don't you? Everyone wants to be cool in our societies. And if you want to be cool, you need the latest, coolest products, right? So that's what perceived obsolescence is all about. These two things drive constant consumption is basically the, the end goal. And so at this point, I want to take on, you know, because some people might say, well, actually, you know, all this stuff about, oh, we don't have good information, all that is bogus, because the information that we need is provided by the marketplace, you know, the free market, the price of products determines, uh, you know, whether you should buy it or not. And, and the market figures all that out, balances all that out behind the scenes. So we need to look at this, you know, what about this idea of the free market? Does it give us all of the information we need to make ethical, sustainable decisions? You know, the theory goes that we are all, you know, rational utility maximizing individuals. Each one of us is just out to sort of like balance out with the money we have and the stuff we want and maximize our happiness. So this is how sort of um, classical economics works. This is how, this is the theory anyway. You know, so, so again, does the market give us the information we need to make good decisions? Well, basically, if all we have is the price of a product through which to make a decision, price leaves out a heck of a lot. It's because of this idea of externalities. And what an externality is, is it's a cost of production that a corporation has successfully been able to avoid paying. Instead, they externalize those costs onto the broader society. Who pays? Everyone pays, not the corporation though. And so because corporations externalize a whole bunch of costs, they're able to keep the cost of their products down. And so the consumer's like, oh, yay, I'm paying less for this. And yet we're paying more for all of the other things that have been externalized, right? 
And so what are th such things as externalities? Well, pollution is an externality, right? Waste is an externality. Energy, fresh water, all of these things that corporations gobble up in their production processes, if they're not paying for them and then you know passing that price on to the consumers, we all end up paying for it in the sense of you know polluted environments, um, you know poor air quality. Um, but even you can get into things like um, the uh, military power necessary to secure oil resources in other parts of the world, right? So externalities can be pretty intense and they're not factored into the price that we pay for our products. In fact, in many cases, the lowest price that we can get as consumers is usually associated with the least ethical and the least sustainable options. So think about that, folks. How messed up is that? All of the economic incentives, or I'd say not maybe not all of them, I'd say 90, 95% of them, encourage us to do the wrong thing in industrial capitalist societies. If we're always going for the, you know, the cheapest possible products, we tend to be supporting the worst labor practices, the most environmentally destructive practices, right? So it's a big, big problem. So that's dissociation. Those are all the different ways in which we are cut off from good information about exactly how our society works and exactly the impacts that our society has on uh, the natural world and on human beings in other countries and poor people in our own countries, that sort of thing. Um, but the other side of the information problem deals with scale and complexity. Um, and there's a concept that I want us to think about here, first of all, and it's the concept that's known as spaceship Earth. And certain environmentalists started talking about this in the late 1970s, early 1980s. The idea here is that, you know, now that our economy encompasses the entire planet, and it does, right? Every country of the world is linked in this global, political, economic, cultural system. Because of this, there's nowhere to run if this whole thing collapses, right? There's nowhere to run if we destroy the biosphere, if we destroy the physical basis for life on Earth. Planetary boundaries impose hard limits on our global civilization. We're really going to um, talk about this in uh, the lecture in week five, where we talk about ecological overshoot. We talk about bumping up against the actual limits of the planet, fresh water, soil, wildlife, forest, fish, you name it, all of these things were growing right up to the limits on, right? And so this is a big problem. Um, the, the sheer size of this uh, global economy can have devastating impacts. But again, it's hard for us to see these impacts because we can't contemplate the whole all the time. We have a hard time thinking about the global effects of local actions. A really important concept here um, is systemic risk. And systemic risk is the idea that certain behaviors that we engage in as individual human beings, uh, work, you know, living our lives, going to our jobs, driving our cars, all, buying our products, certain individual behaviors, when they're complexly linked with a whole bunch of other people doing them, and then they're scaled up when all of a sudden there's millions and even billions of people doing them, that these behaviors can crash the entire system. And this involves um, this concept of positive feedback loops and tipping points. So a tipping point is a, a point within a system where a certain process starts rapidly scaling up. It starts doubling, tripling, exponentially increasing. It starts running away. An example of here from um, climate science is what's known as the ice albedo effect. Um, the ice albedo effect is basically the amount of energy that enters the Earth's atmosphere and the amount of energy that leaves the Earth's atmosphere. And one of the things that determines how much energy is absorbed by the planet is how much ice there is that covers the Earth. Because what ice tends to do is it tends to reflect solar radiation. So solar radiation comes in, it hits ice, it bounces back. If that solar radiation hits Earth or open water, more of it is absorbed. The more energy absorbed, the more heat that is trapped in the Earth's atmosphere. 
So this is what, what sort of happens. And as, as, as solar radiation hits the earth and is absorbed, the temperature increases. As the temperature increases, the amount of ice decreases, the ice melts. We're seeing this in the North Pole, we're seeing this in the South Pole, right? The glaciers are melting. The less ice, the more, so as ice decreases, Earth's albedo increases. The albedo is the amount of trapped energy because less ice means more open water. More op open water means more energy is absorbed. The absorption increases the amount of absorbed light, and that then increases the Earth's temperature. So you get this positive feedback cycle, right? More temperature, less ice, less ice, more energy absorbed, higher temperature, higher temperature, less ice. It just keeps going around in a circle and it leads a certain thing to run away. In this case, it's the earth's temperature, right? It gets more and more, um, it starts to run away, right? And the problem with systemic risk is it often can't be dealt with in isolation, right? So again, how do you solve, like me or you on the call here? Oh, we're gonna solve the problem of the ice albedo effect. Well. Uh, where do you start, right? Like all of the different things that are leading to the increase in temperature, fossil fuel production, transportation, globalized supply chains, right? Where do you start? It's so big and complex that you can't deal with it in isolation. You need large scale coordinated action to deal with systemic risks. And large scale coordinated actions in a hyper complex global system is very, very difficult to pull off. So let's talk a little bit more about tipping points. These are points, these are moments in the life of a system where a positive feedback process really starts accelerating, right? So, you know, a, a feedback loop starts, this is where we call it running away, this rapid acceleration. And the problem with tipping points is once you've reached them, System change can become unstoppable. It's almost like it's too late. Things just start spiraling out of control. The problem with tipping points is that a lot of times you just see them in, in hindsight or you see them when, oh, it's happening. It's hard to predict when they're going to happen, right? And usually it's like post hoc. You go, oh, wow, clearly that was a tipping point, right? And again, you see this with political revolutions and you see this with ecosystem collapses. You know, like I said a few slides ago, it can take years, decades, even centuries of slow buildup for a system to radically change. That radical change is the tipping point when all of a sudden things run away. You know, in the case of that lake getting slowly polluted, all of a sudden the level of oxygen reaches a tipping point and boom, it just can't support life anymore. The oxygen just gets snuffed out, right? Um, in terms of um, societies, you can have, for instance, growing inequality and it grows and grows and grows and there's more and more and more political dissatisfaction, more anger, more desperation builds up in that society until, bam, it hits a tipping point. And all of a sudden you get hundreds of thousands or millions of people in the street and you get governments collapsing and you get civil wars breaking out, right? Those are tipping points where all of a sudden that civil unrest just spirals out of control. Again, the tricky thing is it's hard to know how close you are to one of those tipping points until it actually happens. So I'm going to give you an example of just a couple of tipping points or, or sorry, a, a couple of um, complex uh, system problems that show systemic risk and tipping points and, and just how complex they are, but also how these things happen. Um, and they happen fairly regularly in our society, and also the effects can be quite devastating. So the first example I'm going to go through, oops, sorry, is um, the global financial crisis um, of 2008. And all global financial crises are similar. They're examples of systemic risk. But in the case of 2008, there was a few different things that happened. So I'm going to go through a little bit of a, a timeline of, of what happened here. So first of all, what you had through the, uh, the 1990s and the early 2000s 
were declining rates of profit in what's known as the real economy. The real economy is the economy that produces goods and services. You know, factories producing tennis shoes or pencils or, uh, you know, uh, yoga apparel or, you know, companies providing services, fast food restaurants, whatever. All of those are um, companies operating in the real economy. And rates of profit were going down for a few different reasons, increasing competition, uh, not just within uh, North America, but globally, right? Global competition was increasing, tends to keep wages down. And if you're someone who's got a lot of money, if you're a rich person and you want to invest it, uh, you don't want declining rates of profit. You want high rates of profit, right? So then you want to start investing money in other places that are more profitable. So that's one thing. We'll park that there. Investors are like, ah, we're not making enough money. We want to look for places to make more money. Another thing that happens that's part of this whole systemic risk scenario is big investment banks start saying, um, or sorry, not investment banks, but um, commercial banks. So banks that basically make a living off taking deposits from you and me and Ma and Pa, and we have our little bank accounts, right? These banks started going, well, we want to get into financial speculation. We want to get into, you know, the stock market and hedge funds and derivatives and all this sort of stuff we want to make because that's where the money is, right? The money isn't in the real economy anymore. It's in the financial markets. And so these banks start lobbying government to say, hey, let's get rid of these regulations that keep us all safe so that all of our banks can't gamble with our savings, right? And they start lobbying the government to change these regulations. And the government, of course, you know, money talks, right? So the government's like, okay, we're going to take away all these regulations. Go for it. Banks is the wild west. You can take ma and pa's savings. You can gamble it on the stock market, right? So what starts to happen is more money starts flowing into the financial economy. So this is the economy of, of the stock market, right? Of, of selling and buying various stocks, various financial products um, like securities. And securities are where you bundle together a whole bunch of different debt obligations. It could be mortgages, it could be car payments, whatever. It's fairly complex. I don't want to get into it too deeply. But the, the important thing to know is that more investors start pouring money into financial markets. Big banks start doubling down on, on financial speculation. And that's what financialization is. Financialization is when your economy moves from producing actual stuff to simply just trading money back and forth in various forms. A big thing starts happening is one of the main forms of securities that, that, that starts really taking off in the early 2000s um, are securities formed from mortgages. And so, you know, a, 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 a mortgage-backed security is basically a financial product that a big bank creates and it bundles together you know, thousands uh, or sometimes even tens of thousands of mortgages. And it says, okay, all of these mortgages uh, will back this security that then you can buy and sell on the stock market. And because this was so lucrative, housing prices were increasing, more and more money was flowing into housing. Uh, banks were encouraging people to get more mortgages. And they started to say like, okay, well, in order to make more money, we need more people getting mortgages. But people are kind of tapped out. All the people that can afford mortgages had already gotten them. So instead, we need to get people to buy mortgages who really can't afford them. We need to offer people super, super low interest rate mortgages. And these were known as subprime mortgages. And we also need to do it in such a way that we will fudge the numbers if we need to. We will make sure that people who normally would fail a credit check, doesn't matter, we'll give them a mortgage anyway. Um, we'll give them shady mortgage deals where, where there's a low rate for a couple of years and then the rate's gonna jump, right? We don't care if they can't afford it then. So there's all of this fraud that starts occurring. And also too, what starts happening is, you know, um, subprime mortgage securities start being created, but the banks don't let investors know that, oh, well, this security is formed from legit mortgages from people who've passed credit che checks and the banks have signed off on them and they're financially solid. But these subprime mortgages are like, yeah, they're going to fall apart in one or two years, right? But the banks didn't say that to investors. The banks didn't let the investors know there was greater risk. 
And that's fraud, right? That's illegal. But this started happening because basically people start making money hand over fist. All the money flowing into the housing market, all the money flowing into these financial securities. Mortgage brokers are making tons of money. Investment bankers are making tons of money. Uh, people are being like, woohoo, cheap mortgages. They're buying extra properties. They're mortgaging their own homes to the hilt. Things start running away. We should be thinking tipping points in our minds, right? Until it all falls apart, right? And so what starts happening is, well, all those people with subprime mortgages, um, they start defaulting on their mortgage payments. You know, their houses start going into receivership. The bank starts being like, uh oh, we're not getting any more payments. And this ripples up and all of a sudden huge investment banks like Lehman Brothers and Wachovia start being like, oh my God, we literally can't pay our debts now. We can't pay our financial obligations to other banks. Massive banks start collapsing. This starts rippling out through the whole housing market, you know, causing basically the housing market to collapse. The bank failures then cause what's known as a liquidity crisis. A liquidity crisis is where basically banks stop lending money. So you can't get money for your business loan. You can't get money for all these other things that the economy needs to function. And this basically turns into a global financial market crisis. Uh, it's what, what's known as the Great Recession now, to separate it apart from the Great Depression that happened back in the late 1920s and the 1930s. What, what happens? You know, trillions of dollars of investments just get wiped out. Um, massive, massive foreclosures of people lose their homes, people lose businesses, people's savings is wiped out. In order to bail out the banks, trillions of dollars of taxpayer money just gets handed over to the banks. What do the banks then do? Pay their CEOs bonuses, right? Like it was a total nightmare, folks. It transferred wealth from working and middle-class people up to bank CEOs to a level that's never been seen before, right? And it led to a massive, massive recession, economies shrinking all over the world. Again, lots of financial devastation, lost jobs, um, increased deaths of despair, overdoses, suicides, you name it. It was a real um, catastrophe for the global economy. That systemic risk, right? All the individuals involved in that chain were just doing like, oh, well, this is just what's going on. Well, housing prices are going up. I'm going to invest in housing, right? Oh, hey, mortgages are lucrative and you can bundle them together and sell them to people. I'm going to do that, make some more money. Oh, I'm going to fudge the numbers a little bit here, a little bit there. Every individual actor was just acting in their own self-interest, but they weren't thinking that if their actions were scaled up, that it could actually crash the whole, not just housing market in the US, but the whole global economy could come close to just like completely collapsing. And yet that's what happened. So that's systemic risk from a sort of economic perspective. Financial collapses are examples of systemic risk. But we also see this in um, ecological situations as well, you know, and climate change is a perfect example of this. Because really, climate change, at the end of the day, is a problem of economic growth. Because as our economies, industrial economies grow, what does that mean when an economy grows year after year? Well, it means more production, more consumption. What drives production and consumption? Energy use. So it means more fossil fuel use. Well, more fossil fuels means more greenhouse gas emissions, right? So this increases the parts per million of greenhouse gas in the environment of carbon dioxide, of methane, right? And these gases, as they accumulate in the atmosphere, trap heat and they warm the planet, right? So at the same time, economic growth, it increases emissions, but it does another devastating thing at the same time is it destroys carbon sinks. What are carbon sinks? Green spaces. Economic growth means let's chop down that forest. Let's put in a, a new strip mall, right? Let's pave over that prime industrial land. Let's create an airport or let's create another, another big box store or something like that, right? And of course, what green space does is trap carbon and produce oxygen. It's like plants are our best flipping friends. And yet we're trying to like wipe them off the, the face of the earth, right? Very, very silly um, long-term strategy. Of course, what all this leads to is more global warming, which has incredible environmental impacts, 
human impacts, potential tipping points where warming can run away and get really, really intense. So climate change, again, we're talking systemic risk. If you crash the global, um, the global climate such that, you know, in 50 years, we've heated three to four degrees, our planet will, will be unrecognizable to what we know today. You know, there will be vast regions that are uninhabitable. There will be massive migration, warfare, instability, because certain parts of the world will sim simply be uninhabitable, right? Um, this is systemic risk. Each individual engaged in economic activity, we don't think about this. We don't think about how it's going to ripple up and, and, and magnify and multiply such that it can actually you know, fundamentally alter the global climate. And yet that's exactly what can happen. So another example of systemic risk comes from things like global pandemics. So for instance, with COVID-19, we saw a whole bunch of different ripple effects that were um, impacted by the pandemic. So first of all, it led to a crisis in healthcare systems around the world. It led to an economic crisis as countries locked down, as supply chains ground to a halt, as people were put out of work, as small businesses foreclosed. That then led to a social crisis, you know, people out of work, people living in fear, lots of protest and upheaval, which then led to a political crisis, right? You know, and we're seeing this right now in Canada. We're seeing this with this truck convoy that has sort of taken over downtown Ottawa, the capital of our country. And it has gotten so intense that the prime minister has now invo invoked um, the Emergency Powers Act. It used to be known as the War Measures Act. And uh, this has only happened, well, actually, sorry, three other times in our nation's history. One was World War I, understandable. One was World War II, understandable. The third was in the 1970s. It's what's known as the FLQ crisis. It was this big uh, political standoff happening in Quebec. Um, where these radical um, uh, sort of anarchists were kidnapping uh, members of parliament and stuff. Um, and it's been invoked today. Very serious business, folks, to invoke this emergency powers um, authority. So, you know, pandemics are examples of how certain things um, can hit and they ripple out through the whole society and they can actually threaten the functioning of the whole society, right? And of course, we have to understand, this can make, make, make it sound weird to people. We lucked out with COVID-19. Had it have been more lethal, I mean, all of these effects would have been truly devastating. You would have seen serious social upheaval. You would have seen real, real challenges, if not collapse in certain situations. But because it wasn't as virulent as it could have been, our systems were kind of able to roll with it. Although there's, you know, there's been a lot of collateral damage. The last thing I'll point out too, is that in terms of systemic risk is there's also an example of it um, in terms of the housing crisis that we're seeing right now. Um, we're seeing it really ar um, ar around North America for sure, all through Canada and the United States. Um, but in Hamilton in particular, it is, you know, housing prices have been increasing drastically and rents have been increasing drastically too. You know, and what's been fueling this? Well, it's a complex mix of things. First of all, a lack of affordable housing. There's simply not that much affordable housing that's been built in the past 20 years. Before that, there was. There was a lot of housing that was built that was affordable. Um, there's also a problem with international investment, and particularly in Toronto, in Vancouver, to a certain extent, Ottawa, Montreal, big centers have become um, targets for international investment, where you have, you know, investors from all over the world being like, oh, Canada's a stable country. Oh, housing's a stable investment. Let's invest. Let's buy a bunch of condos in downtown Toronto. Let's buy a bunch of retail properties or whatever. That drives up prices and drives up rents for people in Canada. There's also a lack of simply just market value housing. So just a lack of regular housing for, for anyone to buy. So again, not as many houses have been built. Also an increase in short-term rentals, the whole, the whole Airbnb phenomena. You have more and more people being like, oh, I'm gonna buy a condo and just Airbnb it. It's an investment property for me, but you've just taken another home off the market that a young family maybe looking for a starter um, you know, home could have bought. 
Um, there's also, you know, issues with condo conversions as well, right? So converting rental housing to condominiums means there's less rental housing available. That tends to increase rents. There's laws on the books that actually favor vacancy. So if you're a, a property owner and you own a bunch of properties and some of them are vacant, you pay less tax on the vacant properties. So then it becomes an incentive to be like, oh, okay, I'm just going to buy a couple of investment properties, leave them vacant, let them appreciate in value, and then I'm going to flip them at some point, right? So again, it encourages property speculation as opposed to encouraging just home ownership, right? Like having properties available for people to buy. You know, and finally, the other side of things is, you know, there's a problem with supply, but there's also a problem with um, the ability of people to pay for that supply. And that means that wages have not kept pace with inflation. They certainly haven't kept pace with the inflation in housing prices and rental prices. So you have the perfect storm of like housing prices increasing, rental prices increasing, wages decreasing or staying the same, right? And so all of this basically means that it's incredibly difficult to buy a house right now. And also rents are astronomical. It is really hard for people to afford a place to live. You know, and again, I think a lot of people on this call probably know all about this, right? This is really hitting home. But this is another example of systemic complexity, right? You have, you know, uh, this housing crisis and it is a real crisis. It's caused by all of these different factors that individually people are like, oh, it's not a big deal. You know, so what that, you know, I'm, so what that I'm doing an Airbnb? I'm not hurting anyone, right? But if you and 5,000 other people in your city do that, that's a huge problem, right? That scales up and interacts with all of these other things and can lead to systemic risk. It can lead to basically, you know, when we, we talk about a collapse in the housing market or, or a housing crisis, it's like all of a sudden, most of your population can't afford to live, can't afford a place to live. That's a huge problem, right? That has social implications, that has political implications, right? So uh, it's a place you don't want to end up in uh, as a society. So at the end of the day, folks, what this lecture is all about is the fact that one of the critical things we need if we're going to make it through the, the time of crisis that we're in, if we're going to address all the challenges we face, is we need accurate information. And a civilization that can't access and act on accurate information, that civilization is doomed. I mean, history has shown us this over and over again. You won't be able to understand potential threats. You can't predict when threats are going to arise. And even when the threat's staring you in the face, you can't come up with an effective solution. You can't do any of these things without accurate information, right? And, you know, this is, I have a, reason, a picture of, of this doofus here from the um, uh, January 1st, or sorry, it was January 6th um, of last year, that the sort of capital insurrection that happened, you know, and, and this was an example. And I think this, 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 this guy kind of sums it up of when you get so down the rabbit hole in sort of a fantastical way of viewing at the world of viewing the world which if you're a QAnon adherent you, that's what's happened right you've kind of delinked from from the world of reality and, and science and facts and 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 you know concrete tangible stuff when you go down that rabbit hole like you're in big big trouble because when you lose touch with the actual feedback that real tangible systems give you that the planet gives you, that your other human beings give you, right? When you lose touch with that, it's impossible to deal with what's coming down the track, right? You know, and, and that's, it's a very dangerous and very sort of scary place to be. However, we know that there are some ways to improve our access to, uh, to information and our ability to make decisions. Democracy, first of all, is super important. Democracy is about hearing all voices and all, all opinions and all perspectives when you're trying to make a decision. So things that increase democracy help us make decisions. Cooperation helps, right? So working with other people to improve situations, working with other people to mitigate risks, very important. Science, again, the most single most important tool we have to understand the world we live in and to solve problems. And, you know, and let's be, let's be clear, folks, science isn't just believing anyone who's like, I'm a scientist, believe me, no, no, then you know what, if they're saying that, they don't really believe in science. Science isn't about any one individual. It's about a process, a process of open information, open knowledge, free speech, 
open debate and critical thinking. This is what leads to the best decisions. That's what science actually is. Science is a process. It's not any one person. It's not any one study. But that process of producing research, critiquing research, coming up with new theories, critiquing those theories, testing, 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 all of these things, when you take them together, they're pretty powerful. They help us understand things. They help us solve problems. So these are the tools that we have. We have them available to us, right? And in the next couple of lectures, and as the, as the course goes on, we're going to find out what stands in the way of us using these tools um, effectively to solve the kinds of problems that we, we talk about um, in the first part of the course. So folks, thanks very much. That is it for uh, the lecture for week three. And uh, we will see you soon um, in uh, another lecture.